Invite somebody and welcome to lunch with Jesus. Hallelujah. I know that my Redeemer lives. The words of Job. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah.
Our Heavenly Father, we adore you, we reverence you, we bow before your holy presence. We magnify you as our King and as our Lord. Even as we know that you've given us, O oh God, all authority and all power. That every principality and power of darkness is subject to us, O oh God. And if we choose so, it's under our feet. That this is what you have given us and this is who we are in you, Lord Jesus Christ. So as we have this session, Lord God, we take our positions as sons of God. And Father God, we proclaim a new day even over the atmosphere of this nation and the nations of the world. We thank you, O Lord, for the training that you've given us, O God, over the last... Um, one six months we honor you and we honor your ways oh god they are so different from our ways and lord jehovah king of glory we today say make us what you want us to be make us what you want us to be oh god let us not be who our mamas told us we are who our daddies told us we are who our communities told us we are, but let us take our positions based on who you say we are. And from that place of identity, Lord God, we rule and reign. We honor you, Jesus Christ. We honor the blood that you shed for us. We honor your sacrifice on the cross. It's the center of everything. It's the center of everything. Because of you, we are able to arise and be co-heirs with you and be called sons of God. We honor you, Jesus. May we never forget. May we never get it mixed up. And indeed, because you came to seek and save that which was lost, we take our positions, O oh God, where we are not satisfied with the fact that so many people are lost, O oh Lord Jehovah God. But we say, give us this mountain. Give us this people. Give us, O oh God, a fresh anointing of evangelism to win souls for you and to endear them to you. And if anybody is watching right now, Jesus, that doesn't know you as Savior and Lord, it was my prayer and my cry that they would hear your voice calling them to you and that they would return to you even in the mighty name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Who told us we are. Who our communities Sorry, give me just a sec. Right now, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Great is your faithfulness and great is your power. Father, as I minister this word that's been heavily on my heart about um, uh, turning away from the patterns of this world, I pray, Father, that your children would hear your voice indeed and that they would hearken to it and turn to you wholly, even in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen, amen. Karibuni sana. I can see quite a number of you on. Um, we've got 72 people right now. I believe the Lord will continue to add to our numbers. It's been a while since I ministered. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Apostle Catholic again, Yoganga, an apostle of Jesus Christ. An apostle is simply put someone who's been sent with a message by God. So it's a messenger of God. So it's nothing elaborate or anything um, out there. It's as simple as that. It's just a servant of God. So I'm here with a message um, from the throne of mercy. I'm here with a message from the Lord Jesus Christ for us today on this wonderful day, even as we're coming to the conclusion of the birthing month of uh, September. And uh, we thank God and thank you so much for inviting your friends, your family and having them here. Um, Karibuni to Sozo Church of God. For those of you that don't know, Sozo is a simple word in Greek. Uh, if you type in biblical meaning Sozo, you'll actually find 110 scriptures that explain to you what Sozo means. It means salvation in some places, healing in some places, deliverance in other places. So it's a very, very powerful word and it really stands for who we are in Christ. Uh, we are Sozo. We are saved. We are healed. We are delivered. We are made whole through the blood of Jesus Christ. And we thank God for that. So as you may know, the, the New Testament uh, was written originally in Greek. So this is where this word emanates from. I find that sometimes I've, people who are looking for controversy pick on the word and say, what kind of a word is that? Don't uh, expose any form of ignorance when we have Google, because you can actually Google it. Amen. Praise be to Jesus. So um, I've just come from a really powerful conference and I, I bless the Lord uh, for what he's doing amongst us. The Evangelical Alliance of Kenya 
has organized a two-day conference. Sorry, I wasn't able to communicate on it earlier for some technical reasons, which I'll not engage in. Um, but yeah, so I thank God uh, we've been invited again. Um, and really what the Evangelical Alliance of Kenya is doing is something really powerful where they are saying that there are very many voices trying to speak in this season and in this time, and it's such a sensitive season and a time. And as um, a, an organization that, uh, you know, is in charge of uh, various bodies of the church, it's, they've, they've taken their responsibility in a very powerful way to say what are the true prophets of God actually saying in this season and in this time to just avoid confusing the church. I don't know if you're aware that one of the things that Satan does is that uh, if he wants to bring confusion or bring paralysis or just waylay people, what he does is just send out a different sound, a different different communication and what that does is that it can send people chasing into the wrong direction or confusion or discouragement um, and basically the Bible says without a revelation a people perish so Satan basically targets that to stop uh, people from getting their way in terms of the things of God and doing what God is doing and what God is saying um, for a long time uh, uh, I, I, I got a bit frustrated by wondering why people are not hearing because for me it's been a very natural thing to hear from god i mean from as long as i can remember being about age four or five i would hear the voice of god and when it was time to get saved i heard the voice of god and that's how i got saved and i think sometimes when you're a prophet you can just assume that it's something that's there for everybody and yes we hear the voice of god but there's a prophetic um direction that's very very vivid that the lord gives to his prophets and so I think this year the Lord has really gotten me to the place where I've taken my place and it was through the Evangelical Alliance of Kenya last conference that I listened out to when they were talking about prophets and who's a prophet and everything and I was able to listen and say, oh dear, I better take my position instead of just getting frustrated or assuming that everybody is hearing. So I thank God for that and I thank God for EAK and what they are doing and uh, Reverend Connie in particular um, is the one who's leading this but obviously under the chairmanship of uh, Bishop uh, David Oginde. So Karibuni Sana, I've got a very short time because I have class at two o'clock. I'm juggling between online uh, school, ministry. Um, I did mention uh, that my daughter had a bit of an accident which wasn't uh, easy to handle. But I think for me, part of what the Lord did was just remind me again of who's boss, you know. You know, you've got to always remember that God is boss. God is boss. And yes, we are called uh, heirs with Christ, uh, but God is boss, you know. And, uh, you know, so we have uh, Jehovah. And then after that, uh, the Lord, uh, you know, has us right there standing next to him as sons and uh, core heirs. But he's our father. So the father is always boss, you know. And and so, you know, I, I, I grappled a little bit with it. And I was asking the Lord and he said, did I not tell you to take a taxi rather than wait for transport to come and pick you up? Up. I said, yes, you did, Father. And then he said, do you realize it could have been much worse? I said, Father, I can see where this ban stopped. And indeed, it is your blessing. I thank you for the grace that you gave our little girl. She actually got burnt and <laughs> went to the bedroom and took a towel. Um, she's only nine years old. Uh, she has actually just turned nine. It was the day before she turned nine. And she took her cloth, uh, 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 her towel, and she soaked it in water and just began to put it over the wound. And I don't think that in my grown-up years I would have the good sense to do that if I got burnt as she got burnt but the Lord gave her grace that way and uh, she's just been such a sport trying to cheer us up and everything and we bless the Lord because in all things and all situations we must bless the Lord our King and God does not owe us an explanation we do stand by Amos 3 7 but sometimes it looks as though God does not necessarily follow that Amos 3 7 in some especially personal situations in fact I'm reminded of uh, Smith Wigglesworth who had a deaf daughter and this man was used by the Lord to raise the dead. He raised about 25 dead people that were recorded and maybe many others that were never recorded. And uh, his wife being one of them, you know, his wife Pauline. And when he raised her up, you know, he, he, he just slammed her against the wall and just said, arise in the name of Jesus. And, you know, shook her until she came back to life. And, you know, she turned and she said, why did you bring me back? Those were her first words. Why did you bring me back? She was loving the presence of the Lord. She was loving what was going on in heaven but her husband yanked her back 
from the presence of the Lord. But Smith Wigglesworth, in spite of moving like this and, you know, God using him in a very powerful way, especially for healing um, ministry, you know, and, and really just miracle signs and wonders. And of course, a lot of people getting born again. Um, in spite of the Lord using him that way, we still find that he had a deaf daughter. He had a deaf daughter. She sat on the front pew, you know, in every single miracle service and her ears were never opened. So as I go back to the freak accident with my daughter where she gets burned, those are some of the things the Lord reminds us that he is the healer. He is the healer. It's upon him. He is the deliverer. Every good and perfect thing we have from the Father is from him. But also, the Bible does say that all things work together for good, for those that love God and are called according to his purposes. The Bible also says many are the trials of the righteous. Many are the afflictions of the righteous man. But the Lord delivers them from all of them. So at no point does the Father in his contract to us, because what we are in is a contract. It's a, it's a, it's a you know, uh, and, and you know, a contract is in, in legal terms is called an unequivocal <laughs> an equivocal offer an equivocal offer it cannot be withdrawn it is permanent it cannot be withdrawn it's also legally binding it's an intention to be bound and to be legally bound and and therefore if if it is broken then there's got to be a legal redress and that is what jesus christ did for us on the cross you know he made an offer and that's why only when you accept that offer and accept jesus christ as your savior and your lord confess that you are a sinner and without him you're nothing he's the true vine we are the branches inside of him we will bear much fruit and lasting fruit but outside of him we can do absolutely nothing that's the word of God then when we begin to note that then some things will cease and today the Lord has asked me to talk about the patterns of this world living behind the patterns of this world and remembering that heaven is our home you know I came into this world without a child and the Lord has given me four spiritual, four physical children, biological children, and so many uh, countless uh, spiritual children. And, and so, you know, I have more than I came in with. And I will leave this world without any child and without any, any wealth and without anything. You know, Napoleon Bonaparte, I don't know whether he had gotten born again, but still, what a lesson he teaches on the day of his funeral. And, you know, he, he arranged this when he realized he was going to die. And he said to his helpers uh, and, and his highest guy, I guess it was the controller of the state house of that time, <laughs> you know, and he said to him, at my funeral, I want you to do a few things. And one of the things I want you to do is that I want my coffin to be carried by the best doctors in, uh, uh, you know, in, 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 in my, my, what is it called, in my territory. The best doctors, the well-known doctors. I want them to be the ones that carry my coffin. And then I want you to do something else. I want you to have holes in my coffin on the sides and then stick my hands out and make sure they're empty like this, you know, as we move. The next thing I also want you to do, three instructions they had, is to pour out all, you know, silver, gold, and jewels and money all around the path you know so he's basically his procession the way you have the procession where when you're getting married you have flower petals for him the procession of his uh, funeral day was really uh, you know wealth and gold and silver and and rubies and all these treasures and money of course you know and he said spew it all along the way to the procession to where I'm going to be buried and what a happy day that must have been for quite a number of people on several fronts he wasn't particularly a very good leader but then he was a very strong leader anyway he conquered quite a bit Napoleon Bonaparte very short guy um, and um, what were the lessons that he was he was wanted taught he wanted number one I mean really you know some things the Bible says flesh and blood does not reveal this to you so he said that the reason he wanted the coffin to be carried by the best of doctors is to state that in spite of all these doctors being available to him and taking care of him he still died so only God is the author of life he still died. So it's not a doctor who heals you. It's not a doctor who saves you. It's not a doctor who delivers you. It's only the Lord who actually heals. And you can have the best of doctor, but at the end of the day, Jehovah is the great physician. So number two, so that was lesson number one. And I hope we all learn this lesson together. Lesson number two, his hands being empty, that when you go to your grave, you don't carry a thing with you. 
You don't carry your family. You don't carry your money. You don't carry your title. You don't carry your crown. You don't carry your territories. You don't carry a single thing with you. In fact, the Bible says that uh, it's the, our works of righteousness that actually follow us. You know, isn't it? That's what the Bible says, I think, in the book of Revelations. But, you know, so nothing else do you carry. So what are you striving for? What are you engaging yourself to a point where you cannot pray for? What are you, you know, he didn't say this. This is now me saying this. And, and the patterns of this world is about a rat race, isn't it? You know, so what is this you're struggling for? You know, if I worry about my daughter and stress out and get mad, maybe even ask the nanny, how dare you? Where were you? How could you? You know, and I'm looking at all that, you know, bottom line is this girl is in the hands of God. My children are in the hands of God. Everything I have is in the hands of God. And really, bottom line is you can have the best nanny, the best housekeeper and everything. And still, a freak accident happens. I've had my children, by the way, uh, fall. Quite a number of them fall, you know, off a seat. When I'm just there with them, I turn to get a diaper. Poop, yeah, doop. And then, of course, there's always a silence. Then you can see the little tongue at the back that we call as Africans, a little tongue. The epiglot is doing this. And then the scream that makes your hair stand. So anyway, and then the third thing that Napoleon did was say, scatter all my wealth so that then they know that all my riches could not make a difference for me at the point of my death or whatever it is. And brothers and sisters, the Lord has just asked me to remind you of these lessons. I wasn't actually ready to talk about Napoleon. It's interesting because I open my mouth and the spirit of God then instructs it. Um, but basically, we are going to um, the, the book of uh, Romans chapter 12. That's where our reading is from. And just to challenge a few things today, um, in particular, um, I feel led to challenge three or four things today that shows us that we have really conformed to the patterns of this world. The Lord is not pleased about that and we must uh, turn away from our religiosity because a lot of what we call holiness is really religiosity and come back to the Lord. So um, Romans chapter 12, quite a number of you know it offhand. If you don't, you really need to know it offhand as a child of God. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God. Can you hear that begging? Right. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies, dedicating all of yourselves, set apart as a living sacrifice, holy and well-pleasing to God, which is your rational, logical, intelligent act of worship. Okay? We must be set apart. This world is not our home, brethren. This world is not our home. Okay? And, I, uh, and do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values and customs, but be transformed and progressively changed as you mature spiritually through the renewal of your mind, focusing on godly values, ethical attitudes, so that you may prove for yourselves the will, what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect in his plan and in his purpose. So, you know, um, the things that have been troubling my soul as I pray and as I sit at the feet of Jesus and, uh, you know, as I pray for you as children of God and the body of Christ and pray for myself, obviously, as well, and where God wants us to go and as I seek his direction are the patterns of this world and how they have gotten so ingrained in us, you know. And as I was asking the Lord about that this morning, as he was telling me to minister on that, uh, the Lord just told me, just tell my children that, you know, because you don't get out of your mother's womb saved and because, you know, a lot of us are first generation Christians and even whereas, but they are even rather first generation Christians because some of the uh, second generation or third generation Christians are in bigger fixes because they are things that have been learned that are actually religious. Yeah. So there are aspects of being a, you know, and I think the fact that we are African tends to be a bit of a sensitive thing, although, uh, uh, you know, our, our, our white uh, brothers and those in the West have uh, worse witchcraft, I suppose. But there's an aspect where because of being African, but also really internationally, that, that when we get born again, we have learned quite a bit of the patterns of this world. And then because a lot of what we're exposed to is this world, perhaps more than we're exposed to the things of God. And we do need to learn how to expose ourselves more to the things of God, more than the things of this world and basically be a visitor on this earth. Because, you know, you cannot be 
too heavenly for any earthly good. Okay, let me just specify that. You cannot be, or let me not say you cannot. You can, I mean, really it's a choice, isn't it? But you should not be too heavenly for any earthly good. What am I talking about? Have you ever met Christians who are so hidden away from the things of this world to a point where they don't even know what's going on? The problem with that is that you actually become very useless on this earth. And that was not God's intention. When, when, when God made Adam, he put him on this earth. He could have made him in heaven, you know. He could have made him in heaven and then maybe thrown him down with, uh, you know, later, like the way he threw down Lucifer, you know. But then what did God choose? God chose to create earth, make it beautiful, then make man and then form woman you know, from man, and then put them on the earth. And what was the purpose of putting man on the earth? Remember, um, God had this perfect plan. He had heaven and he had, you know, uh, Lucifer as the next in command. And, and he had the angels and he had the seraphims and the cherubims. And, and he had all this going on for him without a human being. And it was perfect. And he didn't need earth. Then there was an uprising in heaven isn't it? And then Lucifer, you know, ends up um, trying to bring the first uh, revolution, you know, the first coup, the first rebellion. I mean, really, when you um, see people trying to arise against the government of the day, I mean, really, that's not new. It began in heaven, you know, and it began with Lucifer. And that's why I do not believe that overthrowing the government or, you know, having a coup is a heavenly thing. I do not see how God, you can pray and seek God's face and then he gets you to begin to plan and scheme and overthrow the government of the day. You know, I mean, uh, that's that's not a godly thing to do. And anyway, it is illegal. Yeah, it's against law, but it does happen. But where did it begin? It actually began in heaven. And, uh, you know, this word, by the way, has really given me strength in the last seven years that I've been a pastor because it's been the hardest seven years of my life. You know, it's been the most beautiful times of my life, you know, but it's also been the hardest time of my life. In, in what way? In terms of being a Christian. And, uh, you know, I have been in ministry for 25 years. And when I was in ministry, it was okay. Everything was fine. And, you know, I was very successful in whatever I did. Then I became a pastor as the Lord called me to plant a church and it became the hardest thing I ever did. And for the first time in my life, I dealt with thinking that perhaps I'm a failure in terms of the things of God. And, you know, I went through years and years. And, and what was the issue? You deal as a pastor with very carnally minded believers. And, and, and I guess you don't get warned about that. And you don't get warned about how you're going to deal with the spirit of religion. And we are about to celebrate. Uh, seven years uh, next week we'll be celebrating seven years of souls when we bless the Lord and he's amazing because at year seven we are finally settled but as you deal with a lot of drama looking back is when I realized that you know a lot of what happens in the church is what happened in heaven and part of my um, uh, resting place this year has been in knowing that God did nothing wrong. God has done nothing wrong. God is perfect. God is amazing in everything and he's excellent and there's nothing absolutely wrong that he can do and the atmosphere of heaven is absolutely perfect and yet still there came somebody under him who had a problem with his rulership. So, you know, it doesn't therefore mean that whenever people arise, that it means that there's something wrong with you. And Satan actually managed to scheme and to plan. Of course, God knew what was happening and God let it be because God knew all things. But he managed to turn away a third of heaven. He managed to turn away a third of heaven. Imagine. And if Satan can manage to do that, to therefore underestimate him is a very stupid thing to do. But going back again to the plan of God, what's the plan of God? Behold, I give you all power and authority over all rulers, powers of darkness and all sicknesses. You know, and the Lord says we shall trample them underfoot. And God says that they shall never be able to prevail against the church. And God says that by no, no harm shall by any means come against you. And let me tell you, in the last seven years, it has felt that great harm could come against us. 
But guess what? No harm has ever come against us. The Lord has been faithful to keep his promise and to keep me as his servant and also to connect me with workers. I can do, you know, there's so much work to be done. If I'm just all alone, I can do nothing. And that's why the Bible says that unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it abides alone. I've had to fall to the ground and die. And it, let me tell you, the place of death is beautiful. I struggled with it before I became a pastor. And then as I became a pastor, I got to learn, let me tell you, it's only dead men who see God. So you know what? I love to be dead. That is the flesh being dead because then only then can I be alive in Christ. We have been crucified with Christ and we therefore no longer live. But Christ lives in us. The life we live in the body, we live through the Son of God. Okay? So there is nothing outside of the Son of God. That is Galatians 2.20. And it's only when you die that you see God. And the thing with this flesh is that unless we are quick uh, before the spirit of the living God and letting him deal with us, it's very easy to say, oh, I'm dead. But the moment you say you're dead, the beauty of our God is that he ensures that he reminds you, <laughs> my friend, <laughs> you are not dead yet. And then there's more death. And Catherine Kuhlman um, uh, said in one of the sermons I listened to that she would die a million deaths before she stepped on the altar to minister. Because if you're going to step on the altar and see the glory of God, if you're going to come to the altar as a congregation member and receive the mercy of God, you need to die a million deaths before you see his glory. And what's that about? That when you shed off this flesh, well, like Napoleon, but like Napoleon Bonaparte, you realize you have nothing and you therefore leave laying claim to anything, then you can be able to see God. But let me quickly address the areas that the Lord wanted me to deal with. So there, there, there are, I think, three general areas, maybe four, that the Lord is uh, deeply concerned about his children that we have conformed to the patterns of this world. Number one is what is marriage? Okay. Number one, what is marriage? You will speak to believers and they're strong and you will speak to people and they're great in the kingdom. But when it comes to the place of marriage, whether their own marriage or the marriage of their daughter or the marriage of their son or the marriage of somebody, you find that even sometimes even with servants of God, there seems to be confusion about when marriage begins. And I know we want to argue that the church wedding is more of the Western way of doing things and all that. But I still want to ask you, you, where did you ever see a situation in the Bible? And I want to dare you to name it. Please name it. Find it, name it if you do have it. I hope I have some people here who like to be Bereans. I would love to see it. I have searched the whole Bible and I've not seen it. Where did you ever see a place where a man and a woman want to become one and to, be, to start a home together and nobody else knows about it, that they actually just begin to live together? Where? Let's begin with Adam and Eve. What happened with Adam and Eve? Adam was all by himself. Uh, God would visit him. He had everything that was perfect. He didn't even have to work, but he was still not satisfied with the presence of God. He was not satisfied with, you know, whatever it is that he had and everything that he had. He was not satisfied with the fact that grapes could fall from the sky or whatever it is. He didn't have to work and everything. He wasn't satisfied until Eve was created. He was put to sleep and the first wedding happened because God is the one who called it forth. So before the presence of God, they became man and they became wife. Okay, somebody has posted, oh, Galatians 2.20, all right, Sasawa. That is just, you have been crucified with Christ and you therefore no longer live. Um, so I have been crucified with Christ and I therefore no longer live. So anyway, um, you know, the first, first ever wedding, it took place in the presence of God, isn't it? And God is the one who basically officiated it. And then you see the Old Testament and then you get into the New Testament and Jesus was at a wedding. His first miracle was at a wedding, the wedding in Cana. And uh, my daughter is singing. I don't know if it is sipping in, but uh, that's just my daughter singing. All right. And, uh, you know, Yanni, she's the one who's going through a greatest trial and she's busy singing as loud as she can. And she's just been such a challenge to me, by the way. Not a single time has she moved around, moping around and what an encouragement. But just back to weddings. So Jesus is at the wedding in Cana. 
So he attended a wedding. And not only did he attend that wedding, but he also gave the sweetest of wine and also chose for his greatest miracle, for sorry, not his greatest miracle, but for his first miracle and his coming out, let me put it that way, that, uh, you know, to his, his first ministry time, you know, publicly was actually at a wedding. What does that tell you? That the Lord requires us to begin our family life from a place of a wedding. And a lot of people think that a wedding has to be a very expensive affair. And in this season, and it's unfortunate because you see online ministry, its challenges is such that you can preach something, someone hops in tomorrow, does not catch up on that something, so you have to keep repeating yourself. So for those of you who are faithful and have been here for a long time, bear with me as I repeat myself because there are people who are new every single day and they ask things and they don't follow maybe the YouTube old videos and all that. You know, it's amazing and it just really, really shocks me and I don't understand how i don't know you know in my family we my parents are married in church okay i don't know of them of them coming to stay you know i know of them being married in church so when i grew up i grew up seeing a wedding photo of my mom and my dad and they were very young okay and then uh, you know my uncle you know, the other uncle who were kind of close to, again, there's a wedding photo of, of, of him. And the people around us, my parents would show us photo and say, this was at the wedding of so-and-so, this was at the wedding of so-and-so, this was at the wedding of so-and-so. Then, of course, the younger uncles, you know, would have weddings and everything. And then when I look at my siblings, you know, um, we, we, you know, growing up, my, my eldest brother, who's got like an age difference of about 10 years, you know, he got married, though he went to the ages. And my dad, my I think my dad at Attended or something we didn't have like the wedding in church but he went to the ages so for me growing up as the baby in our family I grew up knowing that when you want to get married you get married in church I, I didn't grow up knowing that you can move in with a man it wasn't taught to us and here's the thing I want to present to you that how you live your family life is a teaching to the generations Okay, it's a teaching to the generations. And, and, and therefore, you know, I get shocked whenever someone says, I actually had to start checking. This year is when I began to check. And, and a woman of God said to me, I must ask. And I think I had another one tell me to ask again. And that's how this year it stuck. So then when you tell me, oh, you know, my marriage is undergoing issues, I'll always ask you, when did you get married? And that's what begins the drama. Because a lot of Christians tell you, well, you know, another story follows. And for some reason, believers want to get married in sin, but live a blessed life. Are you seeing how we are conforming to the patterns of this world? Because it's this world that cohabits. It's the world that cohabits. Uh, it's, it's, it, and, and, you know, and in fact, I think in the West, quite a bit of the people who are not you know, born again, normally will move in together, then stay together. They give each other a key. So you're watching all these movies. Here's the key. Here's the key. Here's the key. And it's made to look like it's such an amazing step in whatever. Starting even from the place where when you're courting, uh, then you, 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 you have sex. And I'm shocked when people tell me at the altar when I want to pray over them. And I speak and I say, are you, are you, are you, the Lord is showing me you're living in sexual sin. And the person says, no, I'm not. And I say, you know, the spirit of God does not lie. And I say, are you married? And the person says, no, I'm not. I say, do you have a girlfriend? And the person says, yes, I do. I say, are you sleeping with your girlfriend? I say, yes, but I'm marrying her. You're like, huh? Or the ladies, you know, the ladies seem to be a bit more sensitive than the men. But for some reason, we seem to believe that if we're going to get married to somebody, then go ahead and have sex with them. We had a, 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 a dowry proceedings um, in our congregation uh, for a beautiful, sweet young couple. And they kept saying to me, Apostle, please come. Apostle, please come. And I really don't like those things. Uh, but also more from a position where you travel and then you go and you go through the wedding proceedings. And then after you've done all those things and gotten so exhausted, people leave church. So more recently, I'm like, you know what? I don't know that I want to be involved in those things. I think I'll just do the officiating and that's it. So if you leave church, I'm not like, oh, my god the way we changed oh my god the way we and it's like people by the way are getting into this thing where when they want to get married in church is when they come to the sanctuary so i'm getting very very careful about checking the reasons why people are coming to church and everything yeah because i mean really 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 we become users because after that you find somebody has uh left the church and it's it's a really dumb thing to do 
to go to church because you want to get married and you want the, the church to officiate your wedding. And then once it's officiated, you exit. Do you know how much you need Jesus in a marriage? But anyway, so we went and uh, after we'd had the whole thing, of course, the family goes ahead and says, yes, you've been given the bride and everything. And this is where a lot of Christians get confused. So the moment that the elders say, umepata bibi, yeah, in English, you've gotten a wife. And I know I'm pretty sure that this is uh, across Africa. Then you think that at that point, it's okay to hold her hand. At that point, it's okay to hug her. At that point, it's okay to kiss her. At that point, it's okay to have sex with her. It is not okay. But if you choose for it to be okay, then by all means, align yourself to the God of your tribe. Because then you have gone under a religious, sorry, a, a traditional marriage. And at this point, you find a lot of Christians relax. And the men in particular are very happy to relax, sisters. I know you want a wedding, but a lot of you end up giving in at this point, And then you wonder why you never had the wedding after that. If you're going to move in with him, if you're going to give him sex, if you're going to start cooking for him and start getting pregnant, why does he need to take you to church? And he's going to convince you we are married. But guess what? There is a traditional marriage. If you get married under the traditional altar, then that's the altar you're under. Unless later on you dethrone the traditional gods and destroy the altar of those gods. And then after that, you move into asking God to raise up now new foundations for you. Okay, so if you follow a lot of what we teach, then you will learn that. And personally for me, I bless the Lord because not it wasn't intentional, but we were not able to have any traditional wedding before we get, got married for various things that I've shared in the past. And we only had our traditional uh, uh, dealings in terms of at least the dowry. Let me put it as dowry. We did the dowry proceedings only last year at 19 years of marriage. And when my dad was talking about the Kikuyu wedding, I said, I'm sorry, dad, we're not going to have a gurario. And he asked why it's important. And he was getting very upset. And my dad is a new believer. So I had to take on my role as the one who understands the Bible. And I said, dad, do you even understand the meaning of gurario? And, you know, um, and he didn't argue with me because kogurario means to be scratched and the blood comes out. And I asked, which scratching is this that's happening so that the blood can come out? You know, when you're telling me, you know, about that we have to cut, I don't know, their kiade, you know, their kiade is a shoulder, that we have to cut it and hold this meat and go through it and we have to make sure, you know, we don't, I don't know what, my dad says, oh, that represents the cake. I said, dad, you forget something. I already got married. I'm married in church. So I don't need to have a traditional marriage because I'm already married in church. But even then, if and, and, and you know what? If we had gone through the traditional marriage in the year 2000 when we were getting married, I would have ended up having a gurario and thought it's a fantastic thing. And I just bless the Lord. As I say, thank you, Jesus. I did not get around to doing that. I didn't know what I know now. I didn't know then what I know now. And so I bless the Lord for that. But then also some other proceedings like, oh, we are bringing the alcohol and I don't know, we are pouring the alcohol where and all those things. Dowry is necessary and dowry is good. It is biblical. We see dowry happening in the Bible. I remember in the year 2017, I was in Kisumu and I, I got such a major visitation of God. One was the most powerful visitations of God. And I've shared about it. And I saw a camel and I saw all these, you know, these, these amazing whatevers and all that. And Jesus just said to me, this is your day of dowry as I am, you are my betrothed and I take you as as, as my bride and as my wife. And I don't know why the Lord took that long to do that with me. But then I believe he was also just showing me what happens in the spirit realm when we are purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. So dowry is actually a very godly thing to do. It is about honoring the parents of the bride. And dowry does not end by the way. So, you know, you take once and then you keep taking and you keep taking and you keep taking. And it just means that we become one family and we take care of each other on both sides. We take care of each other. OK, so number one was about the marriages that the Lord told me to deal with the issue of what is marriage. And remember, biblically, when born again, Christians have come before God and gotten married in church. Please note, you don't need a big wedding. I don't know why everybody, when they hear wedding, they think half a million shillings. 
when I was going to get married, my husband and I were going to get married, we were very clear we're not going to get into a Cambodia situation. And what we were going to do is that we were actually just going to go before God with, together with two witnesses. That's all you need. A priest who has already gotten their marriage license, because not every pastor has a marriage license. So you have a marriage license. And then two witnesses. Yeah. And the two witnesses, you know, uh, will normally sign the certificate and that's all is, that is needed. But of course, there's all this procedure that is before that by law to ensure that people don't end up getting married twice and all that bigamy eh, is not done. All right. So whenever I hear people saying, oh, you know, we want to have a wedding, but we don't have money. I just look and I say, ah, so you would rather stay in a sinful situation grieving the heart of God than go to a private ceremony, the pastor and two witnesses and just make things right in the presence of God. You have to wear that white gown. You have to dance and everybody has to know you got married. You have to invite everybody and so you would rather grieve the Lord than do what is right. You know, that's exactly what it means. And in this COVID time, we have been proved to, and I posted something, and I said, anyone who continues in a come with state relationship during this COVID time and is born again, you are just being a fake. Why? Because COVID was a fantastic time for you to say we are getting married, but unajua sasa kwa sababu ya COVID. You know, because of COVID, we can only be 15 of us in the wedding. Now it's gone to 200. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't know what your excuse will be. But this was a fantastic time. If you really wanted a wedding with just a few people, this was a fantastic time to still have you wear your wedding gown, still uh, and all those things and all that. Yeah. Then the other thing is this thing where Christians and when it comes to divorce, still within marriage, and I think I'm probably have to, going to have to have a part two of this, still within the aspect of marriage, we have conformed to the patterns of this world with the issue of divorce. So you're unhappy with your marriage and you get divorced. Who told you being unhappy is a reason to get divorced? Carnal Christian. You shall surely give an account before God on the day of judgment. Unhappiness has never been a reason for divorcing somebody. The only reason the Bible gives and still it says God hates divorce. The only reason God gives for a divorce is not even being beaten. is not being mistreated. is not I don't know what. And I'm not talking that you have to live in the marriage. Remember you can be separated from somebody but you're married. So then the issues are dealt with. Okay. And, and, and you know maybe I need another video for this. But being divorced... The only thing that allows permission for born again Christians to be divorced is the issue of adultery. And even with that, I must still ask you, what has God not forgiven you that you cannot forgive? Because then if you were to divorce one another because of adultery, my friend, I don't know which marriage would stand. Because at one point or another, sadly and unfortunately, and I didn't know this before I got married, I don't know if I would have gotten married if I knew it. I honestly don't know if I would have gotten married, to be very, very honest, if I knew it. I thought that when you're born again Christians, there shall never be a situation of adultery. I thought that's not one of the things we deal with. I thought, you no, know, there will never be, uh, you know, being hit. I thought we'd never have a disagreements that, you know, you cannot even have a discussion. I didn't know. Why? I'm a first generation Christian. My husband is a first generation Christian. We have never been exposed to born again Christians and how their lives are. But the fact of the matter is that a lot of times people get married with unresolved issues and at one point or another one person may have, may fall into sin. Sadly. Sadly. So what then do you do as born again Christians if one person falls into sin? And are you dealing with just a one-off situation where somebody fell into temptation? Or are you dealing with a situation where this person has a sexual problem? And sometimes you may be dealing with a situation where you get married and the person has a sexual problem. And that's why waiting before you get married is a big deal. Because if the person struggles with waiting, that tells you something about the fruit. But still, we have Christians who waited only to find out that their, 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 their partners, you know, their spouses have a sexual problem. 
So what do you then do? And that's a subject for another day. And if you keep hounding me, I will teach on what to do on that. But I talked about a sex addiction. But I think a lot of times I expose something, but I don't tell you what to do. And I think for that one, I would want to probably have a separate couples discussion and a separate couples teaching because uh, sometimes I don't think, you know, by then, let me tell you, if I was listening to my teachings and I was single, I would not get married. I would not get married. And I'm not telling you, no, don't get married. But marriage is hard. And these are the things a lot of times you are not told. Marriage is crazy hard. It's going to be the, probably the hardest thing you ever did other than planting a church. It's going to be the hardest, hardest thing ever. And if you do not get married correctly, my friend, it can make you backslide. It can make you turn away from God. It can make you give up. It can be crazy hard, crazy painful. But then the beauty is that it brings a lot of reward if you understand how to do it right and you allow the Spirit of God to teach you. I thank God that at 20 years, I bless the Lord. If I was to go back again, I would get married to the same person. Hard as it's been, I thank God for my husband. I, I love him and I, I bless God for him. Um, I do wish, uh, you know, we had been a bit more prepared, but it is well. The Holy Spirit still came through thankfully and guided us step by step the second thing is that the issue of the divorce that i'm talking about and then remember the bible is clear if you do get divorced you cannot remarry all right so yeah you can listen to we are blending we are blending we are blended 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 we become one we are blending yes those are the patterns of this world they can blend we do not get to blend okay we do not get to blend unless it's a situation where your spouse has had a child out of wedlock. You have forgiven them and therefore you're blending in the child. Not the strange woman or the strange man, but the child. The child can be blended in because the child is still the blood of the family. And remember that you must take care of your responsibilities. Okay, so there's no blending. There is no blending. I don't know you bring in another woman, a little Monica here, a little Lucy there, a little David there, a little, uh, you know, Raphael there, a little, I don't know, Joseph there, a little Marianne there, a little Wageshi there, a little Akinyi there, a little Odor there. My friend, it doesn't work that way. We don't blend like that. Should you decide that you are not going to be married. I have had, but then let me tell you, I have had to get to that place in the junction of my life where I'm like, do I really need this? Marriage can be hard. And I look and I say, eh, me, I want my Jesus. I don't know if I can do this story now. This is just too hard. This is too dramatic. I honestly, you know, and negotiating with the Lord. And the Lord taught me this. And the Lord said, at some point, the Lord finally told me, fine. If you really insist on a divorce, I will allow you, but you need to be aware that it's going to be a very difficult process. Then the Lord allowed me to sit with my grandmother who is going to be 100 next month. And she is still bitter from her divorce of 70 years ago from her husband who died 10 years ago. My friend sat over an hour with her talking about Kageni and what Kageni did to her. And I hear you people are taken to Java and I don't know what. And I listen and I heard the sweet spirit of God say to me, this is what divorce looks like. She had the right grounds, but she has never healed nor recovered. And it's like the Lord was leading me from person to person who's been divorced. And the Lord kept saying to me, this is what divorce looks like. You think that this marriage is hell on earth. Wait until you see hell on earth. Then the Lord takes me to a woman who's gotten breast cancer. And I don't know what. And the Lord tells me, do you know the root of her cancer? The bitterness from the divorce. She never recovered. She never healed. I finally I said, you know what? I will find my happiness in Christ. And finally, as I found my happiness in Christ and I became the wife that I chose to be before the Lord and the Lord wanted me to become, my marriage was healed. Kumbe, I was the problem and I did not know it. Okay? I was the problem. I did not know it. I'm sure my husband had his own issues. But guess what? I can acknowledge to myself, I was the problem and I did not know it. Or perhaps it just takes one person in the marriage cooperating with the Lord and then the marriage is healed. I believe that entirely. And I do need to run. It's four minutes after two. And, um, you know, so if you're going to get divorced, you cannot get remarried. 
And guess what? This is a conversation I had with some married women. I said, you know what? I struggled with being chased. I struggled with waiting. And I like companionship and I like being held. And especially when it is cold. Ooh, I'm being invited to my class. Alrighty, guys. So I really must go. All right. To be continued. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. If I don't accept this, join the meeting right now. Let me see if I can join the meeting. Oh, it has disappeared. Let me see if I can join the meeting. But wait for the voice of the lecturer. Because sometimes they make you join the meeting. Oh, Lord, it has disappeared. Let me see if it's there. Oh Lord, where has it gone? Oy. Okay. <laughs> you guys are in my law class now. I cannot see anywhere. Okay, guys, I, I honestly can't see this, so let me try and sort it out. That's why I guess I needed to go quickly because it normally comes as a notification. You're being invited and then it disappears. So let's continue from this point and uh, we will continue with the other things that the Lord is concerned about. But just remember, if you do get divorced, you cannot remarry. Okay, so for me, my conclusion was uh, I don't know that I will be able to stay on my own. It was already as struggled as it was. Me, I like being married. I like, I like having a mister with me. I like being loved by my sweetheart. And I know I do not need to be someone else. And then I kept looking and saying, I cannot remarry. I cannot remarry. I cannot remarry. I cannot remarry. I cannot. No, we are not getting divorced. So yeah, uh, allow me to go to class. All right. God bless you all so much. And uh, thank you for checking in. We will continue. I don't know what my schedule is like tomorrow. I do need to check and I'll let you know, but this will be continued for sure. Amen. God bless you all so much. Thank you for tuning in. There are other aspects of conforming to the patterns of this world that the Lord wants us to deal with. Amen.